It's time we full send through the entire history of Apex Legends since the surprise release of the game in 2019 all the way through Season 10. This video is a bit thick, so I've added timestamps for you to b-hop around if you'd like to learn more about a specific season. If you enjoyed this video, remember to like and subscribe and check out some of my other videos. I think you'll like them. I'm also considering doing a Titanfall and Apex Universe video, so if you want that video, leave a comment down below. Alright, let's drop hot. Apex Legends released out of nowhere on February 4th of 2019. There were only six available legends to play as for free with caustic mirage available to purchase with legend tokens or apex coins players began familiarizing themselves with this new hero battle royale shooter as they fought their way through king's canyon the game didn't actually take off right away and had a bit of a rocky start with server issues friends lists not working item dupe glitches falling through the map and much more a lot of the legends didn't really work the same way that they do now either Lifeline had a directional shield when she revived, Bloodhound Scan was absolute dog sh**, Gibraltar was debatably one of the worst legends, and well, not as bad as our boy Mirage. His decoy was super obvious and his ult was basically a meme. Oh, and so was the Mozambique and everyone feeding Lifeline ult accelerants. In only six days after launch, a relatively unknown streamer at the time, Dizzy, became the first player to reach level 100. And this was actually a pretty big deal because there were a lot of rumors that there would be secret unlocks at the max rank or that you'd be able to prestige or something. But it turned out the only secret was <laughs> unlocking Wraith's heirloom, which had a less than 1% drop rate with the only guarantee of obtaining the kunai by opening 500 Apex packs heirloom shards as we know them today wouldn't even be a thing until season four but don't worry we'll get there within a few weeks the first new weapon was released into the game the havoc but there wasn't much energy ammo on the maps though so people didn't actually use it that often sniper rifles actually used heavy ammo at the time and you could shoot the wingman a lot faster and if you had a skull pierce on the thing you were cracking over a hundred damage headshots and players had started mastering b hopping and this broken game mechanic where you could skydive across the map by staring into the sky after taking a balloon your jets would actually push you back up into the air slightly as it approached the ground. It was clearly not intended and a bit overpowered, but it was so much fun. 4K damage badges were also a lot harder to come by because damage was only counted on enemies that weren't knocked yet. There was also a small event around Valentine's Day that rewarded the limited Live Die Live badge for reviving or respawning a player. With Season 1 came our cracked out boy with Robo Legs Octane, the first battle pass and first event, as well as some challenges. Season 1 still took place on the original King's Cannon, and players had started to better learn map rotations. And and everyone started dropping hot in artillery, Thunderdome, and my personal favorite, Skulltown. If you were a fresh noob, you'd probably aim for swamps where there was high tier loot, but not that many people. And if you were an absolute sociopath, you'd run caustic and land bunker every time. If you managed to snag some high tier loot like the golden backpack, it actually gave you the ability to use consumables like medkits and shield bats way faster, and it was pretty OP. This would later be moved to the golden body shield and then eventually removed entirely. At the time, the gold body shield was fully replenished after finishing an enemy, which would end up just being a common thing across all body shields in Season 3. In Season 1, we also had the joy of experiencing the continuation of bugs like bad footstep and gunshot audio, inventories being all disorganized, and the lead feet slow motion bug. Oh, and cheaters were running a bit rampant on PC, with Apex banning almost 1 million accounts in the first month of the game being released. There were some shining moments, though, like joining the space program as you flew across the map, bin bug, you'd punch the top of the bin, stand on top of it, and then super jump all the way across the map. We also fully exploited Gibraltar's shield, making him carry a ton of weight in Caustic traps or look like a frog bouncing around with Octane's shield. About halfway through the season, Gibraltar and Caustic were given the fortified passive, which meant they took 10% less damage, and the wingman continued to get hit with nerfs to damage, headshot multipliers, and ammo count. That thing used to have up to 12 shots with a purple mag. It was, it was nuts. Bunny hopping was also pretty much removed, thermite grenades actually started doing damage to doors, Pathfinder got those little blue crosshair indicator dots for when his grapple was ready, and sociopaths could no longer lock their teammates in a room with caustic traps. Yeah, you literally couldn't disable friendly traps for a while. The damage of the ring also got quite a few buffs because it used to just tickle you even in the endgame. Regarding the battle pass, it was a bunch of filler and recolors like the majority of Apex battle passes, but it did come with four legendary skins including Night Terror Wraith, Honored Prey R301, and the reactive silver and golden skins for the Havoc. We didn't expect much from the first battle pass, and we didn't get much. The Legendary Hunt event brought challenges in the Apex Elite queue with it, which, although a cool concept with the top five teams of a match would play against other top five squads of prior matches, it actually led to a lot of camping. This kind of ended up being foreshadowing for the first season of Ranked, which actually came in Season 2. With Season 2 came the release of the new legend, Watson, and a new created energy weapon called the L-Star. It also brought a new version of King's Canyon, the first season of Ranked, new attachments, and several new events. 
The space cows that have been lurking outside the map decided to come hang out with all of us and we learned that their names were Lola and Rosie. Flyers also started infiltrating the map and everyone debated on if they should be called dragons or wyverns. Because of the new wildlife came changes to the structure of the map. Several areas had been destroyed by the space cows, the cage showed up out of nowhere, and creature containment centers were constructed. As part of a couple events, we also got Octane's gauntlet and labs. The battle pass brought new types of cosmetics including skydive emotes, loading screens, and music packs which were basically just better filler than what we had in Season 1. The legendary skins from Season 2 include the Prince of Darkness Caustic, Fugly Octane, a really fat Spitfire skin, and a cool reactive rhino looking R301 skin. Ranked brought a whole new hide and seek meta to Apex, and I'm pretty sure every Apex Predator player from Season 2 knows every crack, hole, and ledge that you could hide on or in on King's Canyon. Luckily, we got some cool skydive trails to show off all those hours of role playing as a rat. People started boosting, dashboarding, and glitching the game to get to Predator by playing in bronze lobbies. Respawn beacons essentially became flares to get fifth partied, Watson was meta, and ammo was very scarce. Speaking of ammo, we had some new options though with disruptor rounds and hammer point rounds in season two. The most OP gun became the alternator, I know, but it had disruptor rounds back then and the P2020 and Mozambique actually became somewhat relevant if they had hammer points attached. The sounds of the alternator with disruptors still <laughs> plague me to this day. Oh, and so does Code Leaf and Code Net. In Season 2, Bloodhound got his heirloom during the Iron Crown event, which also added Octane's Gauntlet as a point of interest in King's Canyon. It was also a time when solos were in Apex Legends, and there were challenges to get top 5 finishes. As you can imagine, solos was kind of loved and hated within the community, some arguing that Apex was a team-based game and that solos had no good reason to be there, whereas others really liked the dynamic of solos and wish it stayed in the game for good. Which it didn't. The final event of Season 2 was Voidwalker, which added labs to the map and a limited time game mode called Armed and Dangerous. It was shotguns and snipers only and everyone was limited to common shields. People referred to the portal as a butthole and a whole bunch of people were butt hurt that Wraith's new legendary skin helmet didn't open up in game like it did in the intro cinematic. Oh, boo hoo. We also got a sneak peek of the new legend coming in Season 3. That new legend was Crypto and with Crypto came an entirely new map, weapon, battle pass, loot and more events. Now a new legend with a recon drone was cool and all but the real hype was the new map World's Edge. It was big, there was a ton of verticality, a train booped you around the map, it was bright and it hurt my eyes. Geysers launched you similar to balloons, lava was hot, vaults had good loot sometimes, and Mirage taught us the right way to party by yourself. And how could I forget the memorial to the good boy? But there's one thing that completely ruined the beginning of Season 3, and that was the charge rifle. This thing would slow you with the baby beam and decimate you immediately after that with the big beam. It was common to run across two or three people from other teams just focus firing you down or your entire team within seconds. It was completely broken and borderline oppressive to fight against. It honestly was even worse than the disruptor rounds from this prior season for a few weeks until it was nerfed, at least in my opinion. Speaking of disruptor rounds, those things got tossed out of the game along with the skull piercer. Instead, we got the anvil receiver for the flatline in R301, allowing both of these weapons to have a higher damage semi-auto mode and double tap for the G7 Scout and the EVA 8, which allowed for quick two round bursts. The gold backpack changed to have a new perk that would now instead give revived teammates bonus health and shields, and the gold armor took the fast use passive of the old gold backpack. The executioner perk was now a passive trait of all legends, allowing them to fully restore their shield upon completing a finisher. Gibraltar got some insane buffs, turning his bubble into a fast revive like Lifeline, and it allowed players within the bubble to use healing items 25% faster. Bloodhound also got some buffs to his tactical and ultimate abilities, but he still wasn't a great legend, at least not yet. Wraith and Pathfinder continued getting nerfed, but they were still two of the best legends in the game, and people also learned to throw their armor on the ground when Crypto's EMP he went off because it used to not damage armor unless you were wearing it, but that didn't stop Cryptos from getting their revenge by flying their own shields around. We also finally got the firing range, and level cap got increased from 100 to 500, allowing all players to earn 199 more Apex packs for free. With the new battle pass, we also saw gun charms for the first time, with the legendary skins being for Pathfinder, Lifeline, the Longbow, and the final unlock was for the Peacekeeper. There were also a bunch of events with various cosmetics, including Lifeline's heirloom, but I'm starting to realize that if I cover every single event, we're gonna be here all day, so let's just say there was a spooky zombies mode, the Winter Express came to town, third person mode made a brief appearance, and everyone became a colorful dummy. Season 4, the one year anniversary of Apex Legends and what a sad letdown it was. We got Revenant and the Sentinel. Revenant was an underpowered shell at release and so was the Sentinel. The battle pass was decent at least with legendary skins for Wraith and Watson and most importantly the better iron sights on the legendary R99 and Flatline skins. World's Edge looked a bit darker this season and had some changes with the Planet Harvester replacing Fuel Depot. 
Capital City got split into Fragment East and West, and Survey Camp was added. Ranks had a bit of a change up this season as it was split between a split one and a split two, meaning each split was between six and seven weeks in length. The Predator rank was replaced with Masters rank, and Predator was now reserved for the top 500 players per platform that were in Masters. Platinum tier players and above could now only party with players of one tier below or above their rank. Dive trails were also changed from permanent to seasonal, but the season two and season three dive trails were unaffected. Sniper ammo and extended sniper mags were introduced, along with Evo shields, which really messed up the loot pool for a while. At the time, you could either find normal shields up to purple or gold rarity of which wouldn't level up, or you could grab a common Evo shield and level it up to red by dealing damage. The turbocharger also got whipped into the vault of goodies and wouldn't return again until season six. The Devotion was put into crates and the L-Star became ground loot. The Apex Overdrive and Killer B skins for Bangalore had to be deactivated because they made her completely invisible. Inventory slots were increased by two across the board, but grenade stacks were reduced from two to one, syringes and shield cells were reduced from six to four, and medkits and shield battery stacks were reduced from three to two. Revenant ended up getting a second Shadow Ball to play with, and if someone died in Death Totem, they respawned with 50 health instead of one health. Blue bins were added, of which only Lifeline could open the second compartment on, and Wraith portals now would disappear if they lasted for longer than four seconds outside the circle. This was because the meta for endgame circles became teams of people wraith portaling all over the place until the other teams died from circle damage. Season 4 had five events with it, including the Valentine's Day Rendezvous, Season 1 King's Canyon, System Override, The Old Ways, and Battle Armor. From these, we got Octane's Heirloom, Heirloom Shards in the Shop, and Bloodhound's Trials where we killed big spooky dogs called Prowlers. I can't lie though, Apex in Season 4 felt like it was at its absolute lowest point. Luckily, Season 5 started the upward trend for Apex once again with the release of Loba. And I think it's no surprise that people seem to like this new legend for uh, some, some reason. The Skull Piercer was back, and the Anvil Receiver was vaulted. King's Cannon had quite a few changes to it with the addition of two massive new facilities, the Ares Capacitor and Offshore Rig, replacing Wetlands and Relay. The Space Cows had retreated away from the map, charge towers were added that could restore the alt of every player on the platform, and most notably, the entire Skull Town chunk of the map was removed and replaced with a little survey camp and a crane holding the remnants of our nostalgia. Crypto's Map Room replaced the landing pad area south for a pulsar during the lost treasures event the event made evo armor the only available type of armor and a new item the mobile respawn beacon was added replacing the function of the normal respawn beacons and if somebody purchased all the cosmetics in the lost treasures event it awarded mirage's heirloom a trophy of himself the other minor event in season five was the summer of plunder but it was just another you know skin cash grab which if i'm being honest is why events are relatively frequent in apex Speaking of skins, we haven't even talked about the Battle Pass yet. The legendary skins this time around were for Mirage, Bangalore, and the Hemlock, with the reactive skin this time going to the Wingman. And I must say, the, the skins in this Battle Pass were actually pretty good. I just really liked that golden, gilded theme thing they had going on. A new reconnect feature was also introduced, which allowed players that had disconnected during the match the option to rejoin the game. This was a little buggy at first, but it was huge, because now you didn't feel like you should just leave the match if one of your friends dropped. Not that you would, it just felt like you should. Mirage got a massive buff in Season 5 where you could now not only control his one decoy, but also his alt of decoys. In addition to cloaking when downed, Mirage also began cloaking when using a respawn beacon and when reviving a teammate, they were also cloaked. Lifeline's revive shield was now detached when reviving, caustic gas no longer slowed teammates, Octane's launch pad was available every 60 seconds and allowed for double jumping, Revenant's death totem had its range removed, and Pathfinder got slapped across the face by the dev team as they more than doubled the cooldown duration for his grab. Hook. The massive swap places out of the crate with the Peacekeeper and the Havoc got several nerfs to its recoil over time. You could no longer infinitely re-grab zip lines and were limited to only three re-grabs before you had to touch the ground to reset the cooldown. Gold Armor had another passive change, this time adding the perk where shield cells and syringes gave double the amount per use. They also added some more depth to the characters with in-game legend interactions and a new thing called quests. These were basically mini campaigns that slowly progressed throughout a season and would be present from season 5 onwards. The story was told through on-screen text with narration as well as with comics. Completion of the full story rewarded players with an epic weapon skin and a legendary charm. Sometimes the quests came from PvE-only missions, which was also new for Apex. Daily logins were also added in the form of treasure packs. Rewards for treasure packs ranged from charms and Apex packs to crafting materials and battle pass stars. It was actually a pretty good way to get people back to playing Apex more regularly, and the lore of the game started fleshing out much, much more. And with a pop of bubble gum, we were into Season 6 and introduced to the new legend, Ram part she sucked but just wait till season seven when she finally had a use oh my god this is so <laughs> crazy this is so crazy
I not so secretly wish they kept that in. Vastly better than Rampart in comparison though was the new energy weapon, the Volt SMG. This thing was like the perfect combination of the R301 and the R99 and for a while it was one of the meta weapons to run. Crafting was a new mechanic added to the game allowing players to collect spum around the map and shove it into these things called replicators that would magically turn the spum into ammo, upgraded shields, gear, and attachments. I joke a bit but crafting was actually a godsend for helping balancing out the horrendous loot pool issues that seemed to plague each season's release. There were several new changes to World's Edge, including three new Hammond Robotics facilities. Launch site replaced a lava field to the west of the dome. Countdown replaced drill site and staging replaced a small town that used to sit below the train tracks to the west of Harvester. New rising blast walls were also able to be interacted with, which would change the geometry of certain locations. Mirage Voyage was removed and the train had stopped and dismantled with parts scattered across the tracks on the map. The battle pass came with a legendary Pathfinder, Bloodhound, and Sentinel skin with the reactive skin this time being for the G7 Scout. Hollow sprays were also new to the battle pass in Season 6. Turbocharger and extended energy mags were unvaulted with regular body shields and precision choke being vaulted instead. With the removal of precision choke, which only applied to the triple take and the peacekeeper, the weapons instead were integrated with precision choke, meaning that you could toggle the choke without an attachment. The devotion was taken out of care packages and the R99 was moved into them. The recon passive perk was added, allowing any recon type legend the ability to use survey beacons to get the next ring location. To break that Revenant Wraith Crypto alt meta that had formed, you'd have to wait two seconds now to go through a Wraith portal after being recalled by a totem. Quests return in Season 6, and I'm going to save all the lore for a different video, but basically there were seven story pages during the quest and one released each week. To unlock the next week's story page, you needed to find seven treasure packs, one for each daily login. After all story pages were collected, the player received a purple Spitfire skin and a legendary trident weapon charm, teasing what was to come with Season 7. Another new massive feature in Season 6 was the beta testing of crossplay for PS4, Xbox One, and PC during the aftermarket event. This event also brought the addition of cost heirloom and these things called flashpoints which were uh, massive zones dotted around towns in King's Canyon that would regenerate your health and shields over time. The ring also never stopped closing in this event. Other events included the September Soiree, a Wii experiment, and another fight or fright. The Wii experiment was essentially a teaser for Horizon and her abilities as it required using grav lifts and even revealed her name, model, and her drone, Newt. What was funny was that Horizon unintentionally was shown off after players completed the first week's challenges, but this reveal was actually supposed to happen after all challenges have been completed over the course of three weeks. And with the release of Season 7, out came everyone's favorite black hole sucker, Horizon. Wow, that sounded so wrong. And with Horizon came the fresh new map, Olympus. Olympus featured longer sight lines, more open spaces, the first vehicle, the Trident, and Beats headquarters. And holy sh**, I almost forgot the Loot Marvins. These guys were great for the Pathfinder mains out there. Oh, and they finally added a Mark All Is Seen button to the menu. Our OCD finally was manageable. Horizon was also released in a very overpowered state in comparison to prior Legend releases. She would go on and continue to dominate the meta despite various nerfs until Season 9, where she got smacked with fat nerfs. The ranked Season 7 split was first played on Olympus and then on World's Edge to finish the season. The more competitive players seemed to much prefer World's Edge to Olympus. Season 7 also brought the brand new, relatively useless feature called Clubs. More importantly though, Apex Legends was now available on Steam, which was massive for the PC player base. An average of 65,000 players moved to Steam to play on PC, and by Season 10, this number had almost tripled to an average of over 150,000 thousand people playing every day and that's only on pc the battle pass for season 7 wasn't bad either coming with legendary skins for octane the prowler a reactive skin for the r99 and a, you guessed it another wraith skin the select fire was vaulted in season 7 and a new hop-up was released in its place called the quick draw holster Apparently, it granted reduced weapon swap time, ADS time, and hip fire spread, but it sure felt like this hop up was useless, providing almost no benefits because it could only go on the RE45 and the wingman. And you better believe, as soon as you found a skull piercer, you were ripping that useless hop up off your skull cracking hand cannon immediately. Loba got a nice buff this season with her black market becoming a black hole for all the ammunition in the area, but the meta was still pretty much a combination of Wraith, Bloodhound, Gibraltar, and Horizon. Everyone ran around with the Volt of the R301 and their trusty sidekick, the Mastiff. People were still finding fun glitches too, mostly with Octane's jump pad. Full teams were seen flying across Olympus on tridents, and with a Caustic and a Pathfinder on your team, Pathfinders everywhere were flying to infinity and beyond. Speaking of flying, Crypto and Rampart were clearly working together on this one, but that only lasted for a couple weeks. 
The quest of Season 7 was called Family Portrait. The mechanics of the quest were the same as in prior seasons with treasure packs, but this time, the story followed Lifeline, Gibraltar, Octane, and Pathfinder as they hunted for an antique battery. There were several events in Season 7, including the Black Friday sale, Holiday Bash, and most impressive of all, Fight Night. This event added Gibraltar's heirloom, Loot Marvin's playlist takeovers, and Pathfinder's Fight Night location. Within the ring, you were unable to use guns and had to resort to good old-fashioned prison fighting, sparring with anyone else in the ring trying to snag the pretty loot. Season 8 came in with a concussive bang, not because of the release trailer, but because of how shell-shocked everyone was and how sh** Fuse was. Zero movement abilities, a super niche passive, and an alt that looked cooler than it was functional. This guy was a hot, steamy piece of huh? spoiled milk garbage. Some people even refused to unlock him in protest of how bad he was. And almost as bad as Fuse was the new 3030 repeater. Inferior in almost every way to other weapons similar to it, like the G7 Scout and Wingman, the 3030 just didn't offer enough of a reason to pick that thing up. What was worth picking up this season was the brand new level 4 extended mags with a Spitfire. And here's how that played out. I'm a big fan of yours. Heat shields were also a new survival item available in Season 8, allowing you a second to breathe outside the circle and also obscure your vision like crazy. King's Canyon had a lot of changes this season, with Slum Lakes and Artillery having some big changes. A whole new area was opened up on the map called Crash Site, and new explosive holds of loot were accessible by planting any grenade at the door. Ranked had a few changes from Season 7 as well. The first half of the split was on King's Canyon this time, and the later half was back to Olympus. Kill and assist count was increased from 5 to 6, and the number of Apex Predators was increased from the top 500 for platform to the top 750. Cheating became a huge issue in Season 8 with high-level ranked play plagued with cheaters. I mean, it was pretty bad, honestly, but at least those diamond players got their skydive trails back. <laughs> Right? Speaking of rewards, the Battle Pass came with a legendary Bangalore, Lifeline, and Flatline skin, with the reactive skin being for the Longbow. The Anvil Receiver made a return in Season 8, and the Level 4 Barrel Stabilizer and Double Tap Trigger found their way into the Vault. This season also set a record for number of patches at 8. Horizon, Caustic, and the Volt saw some nerfs, but they buffed the damage on the Spitfire, and the thing plagued the rest of Season 8. Gibraltar also got nerfed with removal of the faster healing in the dome, and his gun shield now had bleed-through damage from something like a Kraber shot. It still wasn't enough to take him out of the meta, though. The big boy was here to stay. Fully kitted gold weapons and care package weapons could now have their optics removed or replaced, and no fill matchmaking was added, meaning all the Sweat Lord Wraith players could get their fix in between lines of G Fuel. The quest in Season 8 was called Armageddon. The story followed Mad Maggie, a freedom fighter, and Fuse's oldest friend as she demanded for one thing, Fuse's other arm. Fuse, Lifeline, and Bloodhound team up to take her down. There's some tension along the way, and then Fuse finds out that he likes his new friends, and Maggie bites the dust. There were five events in Season 8, including the second anniversary of Apex Legends, Chaos Theory, that brought a bunch of great cosmetics, including Bangalore's Heirloom, and took over the normal game mode with smaller rings called Ring Flares. War Games, which brought four different game modes. One gave players a free respawn after death. The next had shields automatically regen over time. And the third was three hot zones respawning throughout the map. And the last was banner cards being automatically retrieved. Decrypt the Passcode was an event towards the end of Season 8 that required players to find Passcode Hollow Sprays throughout the maps, ending with the finale at the Firing Range platform, which ended up being a teaser for Season 9 and the Arena's game mode. The final event was called Golden Week, which was just a cash grab with some recolors for Octane and Bloodhound. Oh, and shout out to the Nintendo Switch players that were finally able to play Apex Legends and went directly into the kill feed in Season 8. We love ya. Season 9 Legacy was a massive step for Apex Legends. There was a ton of marketing for this season, with creators from several different games covering the release of the new Legend, Valkyrie, new weapon, the Bocek Bow, and the all-new Arena's game mode. Valkyrie released in a relatively balanced state, seeing some play in casual matches and even in pro tournaments. The Bocek Bow, on the other hand, was broken and borderline oppressive at release. Arrows dealt a lot of damage, had super fast travel time with little drop, and worst of all, were almost completely silent. It was basically impossible to push a three stack of bows because you just get melted by three arrows or less to the chest. It ended up getting some damage and fire rate nerfs, which were super deserved, but this thing was nuts. Speaking of fire rate, one of the new hop ups, Dead Eyes Tempo, actually sped up the fire rate more on the bow and the sentinel if you timed it right. Shatter Caps was another hop up that was added as well, which essentially turned the bow or the 3030 repeater into a shotgun. With the addition of these two hop ups, hammer points and skull piercer were sidelined and put back into the vault. 
Let's talk about arenas. It was a fun, fresh new take on Apex Legends. It put two teams of three against each other in a smaller section of already existing maps or on a new map in the same style or theme of the BR maps. The game modes seem to keep interest for a little while, but a lot of players seem to move back to the Battle Royale mode. This may have been because people felt the Battle Royale mode was more fun or there just wasn't enough in rank for people to do yet in arenas. No worries though to the small percentage of arenas lovers as ranked arenas would be coming around the corner with season 10. I think people also got a little sick of that Sentinel Elsar meta that seemed to develop. Ranked in Season 9 functioned the same way as it did in Season 8, except the first split was played on World's Edge, and the second split was played on a new version of Olympus invaded by a big plant thing. Olympus had a new ship called the Icarus added, which if you found the captain's key card within the ship, opened up the bridge, it was full of high-tier loot. I mean, mostly. And several balloons were removed around the map in an attempt to cut down on the fifth partying that tended to happen all the time. With the hype that was the rest of Season 9, the battle pass was a bit of a letdown. We got what looked like legendary recolors for Ram part in the Spitfire and then like the what 30th legendary Wraith skin I mean come on and the reactive skin for season 9 was for the Devo alongside the battle pass came emotes these were unlockable for each legend and could actually be used while sprinting for some really fun moments balance wise the extra damaging low profile passive trait was removed from the game lifeline lost her shields on revives Loba can now run around after tossing her bracelet horizon's gravity lift was absolutely nerfed into the ground he's got a second useless knuckle cluster and all players started a match with the level one evo shield helmet knockdown shield and two shield cells and syringes each this opened up the loot pool a bit as helmets and knockdown shields were removed from the ground loot the triple take was put into the care package and the peacekeeper was moved back to ground loot Finally, the sweats out there could run their wingman PK combos once again. The nice thing about the PK was that it also now had the built-in precision choke as ground loot. <laughs> there were also some fun glitches and things you could do with Valkyrie as well that ended up getting patched, but they were fun. <laughs> There were a few events in Season 9 as well. The first was the ALGS Championship Sale, which was kind of an animal-themed skin sale to help fundraise the prize pool for the championship for up to $2 million. The next was the Thrill Seekers event, bringing the new Arenas map Overflow with several free and paid cosmetics. And the final event was the big one called Genesis. This brought Revenant's massive Scythe Heirloom and various other interesting legendary skins for characters and weapons. The quest in Season 9 was called The Legacy Antigen, and it was carried out across 11 parts of a comic. It was about a fleet of mysterious abandoned ships, a city under siege by nature, the people of the city and the hunt, as the legends look to find a cure for the outbreak. And then we have Season 10, Emergence. The season that released with the most broken character I have seen yet, our boy Lil Nas X, AKA Seer. He completely broke the meta, was almost a must have pick for any kind of ranked or competitive play. And with Bloodhound and Seer both running around rampant everywhere, the game was renamed Wallhack Legends. Season 10 also came with a new LMG called the Rampage. This thing hits hard. And if you've got a handy dandy thermite grenade, you can rev it up for up to 90 seconds with a 30% increased fire rate and the ability to damage or destroy doors. It's pretty insane at medium ranges. The Anvil Receiver and Quick Draw Holster were both vaulted in season 10 with the brand new boosted loader hop up being freshly available. This thing sped up reload time for the wingman or hemlock and even granted bonus ammo if the weapon was reloaded while low. The Prowler was back on ground loot and the Spitfire and Alternator were put into care packages. And not just your average Alternator, no, this thing has the Disruptor rounds back on it from seven seasons ago, which was removed in season three. The season 10 battle pass brought us legendary skins for the 3030 repeater, Valkyrie, Horizon, and the reactive skin with its creepy crab legs was for the Volt SMG. Ranked in season 10 started us all off in World's Edge for the first split and then moved us back over to King's Canyon for the second split. World's Edge saw a lot of changes with refined sorting factory and train yard all being destroyed and replaced with climatizer lava siphon and landslide respectively moving gondolas were also added to climatizer and lava siphon providing some extra fight dynamics around those areas but also for the first time we have ranked arenas which although not as popular as the battle royale by a long shot was nice for those that really enjoy it at the time of the video, it's also rumored that the takeover event for Season 10 will be based around Rampart, providing some much-needed buffs to her kit, her heirloom, which looks like a wrench, and some changes to World's Edge, mainly around Lava City getting replaced with a new POI called Big Mod, 
which is a huge land crawler that Rampart uses as a workshop. And that's pretty much the entire history of Apex Legends. And if you think I miss anything, let me know down in the comments section. Remember to hit the like button for more recommendations like this video. And if you haven't subscribed yet, just know that if you do subscribe, you're joining the exclusive club of less than 4% of viewers that are subscribed to the channel. Have an awesome one, and I hope to see you guys all in the next one.